Welcome to the My Amazon Guy podcast. We're shooting via Zoom today. StreamYard went down, so no live today. Today, we've got John Durkitz, who is the brand growth uh, <clears throat> vice president at Form Brands. And he's joined us today to talk about how they are scaling their brands and what they're doing as an aggregator. So, John, thanks for joining me. Great to be here, Stephen. I always love talking to you. So, so John, um, tell us a little bit about your personal Amazon background. Why are you an Amazon expert? Yeah, so I started in this space uh, a little over six years ago, as many sellers do, uh, just kind of side hustling, reselling products that I found interesting, um, really starting with a data driven approach to figure out what pockets of opportunities I wanted to tap. Uh, I was doing that as a side hustle while I was uh, full time as a management consultant. Um, and that path actually led me to go on and join Amazon. And I spent three years at Amazon overseeing the third party marketplace, owning the PL for the consumer electronics product vertical, uh, but more importantly, really growing that PL by living, breathing third party selling. Uh, Amazon sort of bifurcates the marketplace into 1P retail and, and 3P marketplace, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners know. Well, left hand my, doesn't know what the right hand's doing sometimes over at Amazon. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and that's by design, uh, although some people disagree with that. Uh, maybe we'll get into that later. Uh, but I spent a lot of my time getting to know the business of third-party sellers, engaging with them, figuring out ways to grow them at scale, because Amazon's always thinking about scale, but also how I could work with them individually to coach them through hairy issues around inventory availability, around advertising, around account health. Um, so my time at Amazon was really rich in experience, both understanding the back end of the marketplace and the true pain points of the sellers. Um, and, and during my time there, I, I wore a lot of hats. Amazon has this con concept called SME ships, subject matter expert ships, and they really encourage people to stretch beyond their role. Uh, but one of the, the SME ships that was really formative for me was representing um, my, my country, Amazon Canada, in the customer trust and partner support group, which is the, the group that <laughs> tends to create the most headaches for sellers. Um, but I kind of got a behind the scenes look on how they operated and really appreciated the difficulty of the problems that they faced day in, day out in policing the marketplace. Um, and that really informed how I think about growing brands on the marketplace, particularly growing brands in the true white hat way. And that led me to leave Amazon so, so start before, my own. Yeah. So yeah, before, we, before we leave Amazon, I think people, you know, there's not every day you get to hear an Amazon insider. So what, um, uh, did they use the 80, 20 rule at Amazon? Did they, they're like, hey, we're going to get rid of 80% of the black hat sellers with this protocol, knowing that 20% of the good sellers are going to get caught up in it. Did they use that kind of mentality? Yes, uh, but in different terms. Um, and what I mean by that is systems were designed to constantly be learning. And you want that defect rate, that false positive rate to dip over time, but there was never kind of like a hard target uh, around uh, misfires around false positives. I, I think in simple terms, yes, Amazon was okay with that collateral damage, those casualties, because it was in service of protecting the customer. And, you and know, they, I, they are I, a customer platform. They, the sellers are down here and the customers are up here and they, and they, they're transparent about it. That's true. And the one thing I'll say in my role, which I, I took tremendous pride in is, you know, every group at Amazon kind of writes out tenants, uh, principles that guide their behavior. And in my team, our number one tenant was sellers are our customers. So customer is this, this you were, very you were pushing term. back on the green at Amazon with that kind of tenant. That's great. I was one of the few advocates for sellers within Amazon. Um, and I, I took that responsibility very seriously because it was often my voice and my voice, voice alone in MBRs or QBRs with the seller partner or, or seller performance teams, really raising my hand and saying, this isn't right. Um, and it, it was a tough battle to fight. I, I, I don't want to claim to be a martyr, but at the same time, um, I, I think it's important to note that while Amazon does prioritize the end consumer experience, there are some people inside that are acting as counterbalances. And I was one of them. So, so last Amazon question, then we'll move on to standing yeah. brands here. Um, what, what's one thing about the Amazon culture you know, the business itself, the people that run the corporation that maybe some people don't know about, don't hear about very often. So the easy answer 
is customer obsession. But I think people hear about that very often. They do. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to give that answer because it, it doesn't answer your question. I think um, what people don't talk about a lot that really defines Amazon is is long termism um, and, and long term thinking. The ability. I to, mean, you've heard we've heard Jeff Bezos say, "Hey, I want to get off the rock," and then he's you know he's in a spaceship the next day. So yeah, I'd, I'd say long term <laughs> yeah. thinking seems to be probably on par. Yeah, and it's the willingness to take bets, see them fail, uh, experiment at a high rate see those experiments not pan out or validate or invalidate a hypothesis. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we as sellers or aggregators in my case experience here in 2021 were planned and, you know, baked back in 2017, 2018. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, when I observed things that happened in the marketplace that I was privy to in their planning stages when I was at Amazon, uh, it, it's, it's often amazing to me to see that it took this long for them to manifest. Changes to the buy box, for instance. You know, I knew that they were in process, but there's a lot of testing that goes into them, and there's also a long-term, a lot of long-term thinking that that factors into the ultimate calculus of do we launch this this feature change or this this algorithm change. So I, I love the experimentation that Amazon does. Although some, you know, it's like three out of the last four weeks on a Friday, the A plus content modules just go down for 24 hours. You know, so you know they're messing with things right now, right before Black Friday. It makes perfect sense. Right. Like we're going to rush all of these features one or two weeks before the busiest time of the year on Amazon, because it makes sense to do so. We'll see what happens <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So. All right. So over at Foreign Brands, you guys are an aggregator. You guys have bought dozens of brands. You've raised more than one hundred twenty seven million dollars. You guys have probably picked up a few things about how to scale brands on Amazon. Um, before we dive into that, though, just one kind of interesting question about aggregators. Um, you know, a lot of aggregators are operating in the shadows for a time period. And then once they like, they're ready, they go public in limelight. I, I think people would find that just genuinely interesting. Like why do some of the aggregators operate in the shadows before they come up for air? I don't know if that's the right way to even phrase it, but do you, do you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I think it ultimately comes down to just the identity of that aggregator at its core, right? Um, you know, I, I look at a lot of headlines and on the one hand, I love it because it, it's the space I'm in. I see it growing. I, I love the investor enthusiasm. But on the other hand, I, I kind of look at announcements and I wonder, are, are people really heads down operating? Because this business is hard. You, you know that at my Amazon guy with we're, 160 clients or more. We're, we're essentially an aggregator. We just don't own any of the brands. We just run exactly. them. <laughs> so. but, but to run a portfolio of brands that size at scale and benefiting from the efficiencies of that scale, you need sound process, you need a, a solid team, you need the right tech. All of that stuff takes a lot of work. And I think for us, you know, we're a group of people who, who for which there is joy in the work. Um, and as exciting as it is to make announcements, it's more exciting to, to just be heads down um, working on our craft. So we've done a lot of that. I think in this space, this phenomenon that you speak of where aggregators are quiet and then they suddenly pop up just reflects the fact that it's, it's hard to stand up this business model. You've spent probably close to a decade now building up my Amazon guy. Um, and I would venture a guess that in your own kind of self-critical way, you're, you're still at day one. Um, and I think the Always same trying phenomenon, to scale, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, you're scaling on top of a shifting foundation, shifting bedrock, because Amazon as a marketplace is incredibly dynamic. The rules change every day and the players change every day. And so I, I think that's what you're seeing. What, what everyone is seeing writ large about the aggregator space, there's just a lot to do. And, uh, you know, we, we do like to pick our heads up and be a little salesy from time to time. But if we do that too often, we're going to fail to operate these brands, which is the cardinal sin in what we're doing. So, so when you're trying to scale brands, what are some of the things that you guys do at Forum um, that maybe some mom and pop Amazon sellers can pick up from you? So um, yeah. obviously you got logistics, you got advertising, marketing, SEO, design, merchandising, which, which lever do you like to pull, John? Yeah. Uh, so we've kind of split out our growth strategies for brands into what we call our day zero playbook and our day one playbook. Um, unsurprisingly, a lot of our mythology here at Forum, to the extent it exists, overlaps with uh, Amazons because we have a lot of ex-Amazonians. 
Um, so day one, day zero, those are terms that we throw out. But I think of day zero as really just being good at the basics. Um, and, you know, you can. And what do you, what do you defined, consider basics? Yeah, I, I've defined basics in different ways over the years. And in my brief time as an agency owner, I tried to simplify them for my clients into uh, the ABCs. Um, now, there are four A's, so I'll, I'll mention those in part, but uh, account health. First and foremost, if your account's down, it's really hard to build a business. Advertising, analytics, availability, and then B, brand presence, C, customer care. Those are kind of the basics of what you need to be able to do right, or at least in, in a serviceable way, to really start to think about your brand off of Amazon. If you don't check those boxes, then you're going to have a real struggle selling into brick and mortar or succeeding on a, a marketplace like Walmart, which is actually kind of complicated and difficult. Uh, certainly different than Amazon. So, um, so what do you think separates like a brand that is 5K a month, 50K a month, or 500K a month in sales? What What's like, where's the scale come in typically? Yeah. Uh, one thing that's interesting, and I, I knew this to be true from working with sellers of all sizes at Amazon, and it's it's been confirmed to be in this aggregator space. Uh, the complexity doesn't necessarily step change between a million dollar a year brand, 5 million, 10 million. Beyond that, it, it, it definitely does. But um, kind of within this 500K to $10 million band of annual revenue, the complexity is about the same. Um, now, I, I'm sort of excluding brands that have massive supply chain footprints, multiple suppliers. There is very much hairiness in that and, that, and that is different. But um, as it relates to the difference between a 5K, a 50K, a, a 500K a month brand, that's sort of my point. There, there isn't one. I think all of those brands well, have to be good. Well, something's changed, right? Like the amount of people that are touching it, right? Like uh, the complexities of, of managing a team and the people, right? But, but I agree with your premise. The basics stay the same. If you're not growing traffic and improving your conversion rate and shipping your product, you're dead in the water. No, I totally agree with that. But like, um, do you, do you think that there's any particular basics that get overlooked though, as, as brand yeah. scale or? Yeah, I do. And I'm glad you brought up traffic and conversion because that's, that falls, that rolls up into what I call basic retail math. Again, being good at the basics. Um, and you know, whether it's one of our own brands or, or the brands for my clients that I used to diagnose issues in, it starts with looking at traffic, paid and organic. And then provided there aren't any alarming trends or opportunities there, now it's conversion. What's the customer experience? So one of the things that I, I've always put a high premium on, because it's very easy to get seduced by advertising and, and the sophisticated strategies that people bring to bear. If your page, your product page is not visually compelling, and I, I would consider visually compelling as a step up from truly retail ready, then you're, you're throwing ad dollars to waste. You're throwing them basically in the trash. Similarly, if in your page, you haven't <laughs> played the, the three-part game that you talk about um, as it relates to, to building SEO, if you haven't done that, you're fighting an uphill battle. So there, there's almost sequencing that relates to these basics but where i put a high premium is keyword richness of your listings and then kind of the visual identity of your listings is it right for the product and does it tie back into the brand um i think a lot of that stuff gets rushed in the amazon world because so much emphasis is put on you know mining the right product from the tools that are out there and then spinning up advertising or doing things that are a little gray hat to to drive rank those basic things are forgotten. So I always look there first. And we do that, you know, as part of our kind of day zero work. So, there, I mean, there's lots of different products um, on Amazon. There's the demand gen products where you have to go out and tell everybody about sliced bread, right? And by the way, guys, if you're listening and, you know, don't know this, sliced bread took a long time to catch on. It was invented, but it marketed failed for a long time of period. We're talking years till it picked up. Then there's co-op demand products, the Me Too stuff, the Alibaba Lite 2.0, whatever you want to call it. Um, but but products that you could take, you know, 
let's, uh, you know, let's, let's, I don't know if you have a use case you can share or a brand you, you can publicly share where you, you guys took and grew them, whatever you're comfortable doing. But like, if you're taking a brand from 50 K a month and you want to turn them into a 500 K a month brand, is it as simple as just switching a main image or, or what, what do you guys tend to do? I'll share the story of one of our brands um, that we're really proud of. It, it's a brand called Tough Cover. Uh, it's in the patio lawn and garden space. And the product is exactly as the brand sounds. It makes covers for outdoor power equipment and anything in your household that kind of lives outside your household. Um, and what we observed with that brand was a, a strong fundamental identity, which I've We'll probably get to this later. I, I put a very high premium on. Um, but then just a lot of little things around how it attracted traffic. Um, the, the kind of open space as it related to paid traffic. And then on, on the conversion side, you know, was the copy really telling the story? Was the copy hitting the right keywords? And then there was also a lot of testing, um, you, you know, we were fortunate in, in stepping into the brand that nearly all of the products in the catalog had enough traffic to qualify for manager experiments on Amazon. So we could immediately test, split test titles. We could immediately split test main images, immediately split test A plus content. I think all those things are, are part and parcel um, to optimizing a listing. And I would venture that should be, they should be put in kind of the, the being good at the basics aspect of Amazon. If you're not testing and learning constantly on Amazon, you're going to fall behind. And I, I think it's a continuous journey. It's not a one-time thing. Uh, we have kind of SOPs whereby we're asking teams to, to be split testing on, on a regular cadence. Um, so you're more of a, a 1% improvement guy, not a measure twice, cut once guy. So what 1% yeah. lever can you pull today? Yeah, I think it's the, the accumulation of those 1% gains over time that really make a difference. There's uh, a, there's a British cycling team um, that really incorporated the 1% change. Um, they were the worst cycling team in the world for years. So bad that not even the public cycling companies wanted to sell their own products to the British cycling team because they were worried about the association with the dead last worst team in the world. A new coach comes in and basically says, we're going to make 1% improvements everywhere. And that's all they did. And eventually they became one of the best teams uh, cycling has ever seen. Right. And, and it's, it's kind of like the Moneyball movie too, right? You got Brad Pitt yeah. coming in and he's like, the only metric that matters is getting on base. That was it. One metric to rule them all. And, and, and it's, it's a pretty good movie. I recommend it for those that haven't seen Moneyball before. Right. It gets you to think differently because in that space, baseball was super dinosauric, uh, you know, feel good, feel. And, and, and they'd, they'd go find new talent. We can call them brands or products, if you will. And and people would be like, oh, I think this one's going to work. And I think that one's going to fail. But nobody really knew. But then when you look at it from a single metric, can they get on base? It, it simplified the whole process. And then, of course, the athletics went on to win. 20 games in a row. And that's the number, that's the highest record for, for win rates uh, ever. And uh, the coach of the athletics ends up getting an offer for like $12.5 million from the Red Sox to, to go GM their team. And, and I think the highest paid prior to that was like three mil or something crazy. So what, what's your, uh, what's your money ball strat? What can, what can uh, Amazon brands learn from you? Well, first of all, I, I love that story about the British cycling team. Uh, there's a similar, um, story about Pat Riley coaching the Lakers in the seventies and eighties and focusing on a metric that matters and making 1% improvements in that every game. Um, so I, I think the power of this idea is compelling. And to your question about what's, what's kind of our metric that matters. It's funny. Uh, we're, we're sort of zigging when others are zagging the market right now in the aggregator space, very focused on growth, um, top line growth. And I think that's true for a lot of sellers. You know, you, you get excited when you, you hit your first $1,000 day, your first $10,000 week. Um, those milestones are exciting, but what you can't lose sight of is that to, to sustain yourself long-term, you need to be earning cash, right? You need to be converting cash. So, uh, so, so you, you mean like, are you saying people should raise their prices on Amazon? 
<laughs> uh, I'm not not saying that. Um, I I think if we, all, if we all agree to do it, though, we all win, right? <laughs> I, you know what? I can say it now that I'm not at it. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely couldn't talk about pricing when I was there, but I'm not there anymore. But I, I do think like this is it's easy to get sucked in and seduced by the Amazon marketplace as being different than the overall economy. But one of the most powerful analogies that one of my directors at Amazon shared is you need to think about your storefronts on Amazon as physical stores. And if you were a physical store owner and there was a bad actor in there, what would you do? You know, show them the, to the door. Uh, but also in a world of inflationary pressures, what would you do? Probably bring up prices. Um, or, you know, maybe you downsize your, your products uh, like you often see in the CPG world where, you know, increasingly a bag of chips is giving you fewer and fewer chips and more and more air. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think, I think as prudent store owners, price increases is part of your arsenal, part of your toolkit. Do you, do you guys, have you guys bought any brands that had too many variations and you're like, Hey, we're going to get rid of half those variations. Has that happened yet? We've walked away from brands with fractured catalogs and, and too many variations. Um, you know, obviously there's supply chain complexity attendant to that, but I think more so than anything else, what guides us is the customer experience. Variations, when done right, should simplify the customer experience, improve your conversion rate um, across the entire style. When done wrong, I mean, you've probably had the experience of shopping through, you know, 80 different color style combinations because they weren't properly thought out. It, it's, it, it's very much a, a disservice to the customer and it, it's kind of a, a trust buster for the brand. Um, What's the max number of variations? And I know that's a variable question. There's lots of different types of yeah. variations, but what, what do you think the finger in the air number should be max on that? Just curious. For, for a single variation theme, uh, I'd say no more than 10. Once you start to break, depending on whether you're experiencing a product on desktop or mobile, but once you start to break through more than a few rows of variations, uh, it, it gets overwhelming. It gets intense. It does. Right. What, what, other, what other tips or tricks? I, I really like this one, by the way. Like, hey, here's the best practice, 10 variations. So let's go over to logistics. What's the equivalent tip in logistics? What's something somebody could incorporate this month into their strategy? Uh, I'll, I'll stretch your time period from this month, to maybe the next 60 days, depending on uh, sure. the shipping environment. But I've, I've been thinking about this more and more as we ourselves manage out of stock risk and, and the supply chain nightmare. I think I, I have three rules for managing out of stock on Amazon. Uh, number one, don't go out of stock. Don't go out of stock. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> number two, KYP, know your personnel. And then number three, see rule number one. <laughs> uh, well, that's an old Warren Buffett thing. Um, but it drives, for, it drives the point home. It does. But for KYP, know your personnel. It's it's really like it, as you're a brand owner or a seller staring down an out of stock risk. KYP forces you to ask, what are the tools that you should really bring to bear? We've talked a little bit about pricing. Pricing as a tool to slow unit velocity, extend your 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 in stock period. Price works provided your product is kind of demand elastic, right? Customers shift their behavior in response to uh, price changes. Now, if you're one of the lucky few that has a demand inelastic product, meaning you can jack your price up and you're still going to see uh, units move off the shelves, we have a brand like that, uh, for better or worse, then price is not your tool for that scenario which leads to another option in your kit, which is, do you have safety stock in the US that you can inbound? The odds are you probably don't. Um, yeah, if you, if you don't have a warehouse right now, a 3PL with at least 60 day supply of stock, you're in trouble. Yeah. And, like you're one black swan event away from wrecking your business, right? Like the, the reality and, is, sorry, Steve, but I was gonna say the math of holding stock in the US from a cost perspective, this has drastically changed uh, now that containers are 4X what they were earlier this year. Um, now that Amazon has you know, 
continued on an annual cadence to increase FBA fees, reduce storage limits. Uh, it, it used to be a very simple equation, keep stock overseas, maybe some safety stock on the floor of your supplier, uh, but ship it in just in time when you wanted to kind of get it in Amazon. Now the math really favors having a 3PL here, having a warehouse where you can just park 60 days worth of supply there. Um, all, right, all right, so let's go to advertising next. What's your five minute hack for ads? Five minute hack for ads. Uh, I think, <laughs> I think no, I, I said KYP, know your personnel for out of stock. I think it's the same for advertising. It is hard to be an advertising expert. You need to practice your craft daily. You need systems in most cases. You can run ads well in Seller Central, but I think, you know, as we talked about the inflection points, the challenges going from 5K to 50K to 500K, advertising is one of those ones where um, you, you probably need to enlist help before you think you need it if you want to hit those, those next inflection points in your sales. It is difficult, exponentially difficult to run effective advertising on a large catalog. Um, in Seller Central. Uh, so there's there's a competency barrier, there's, there's a systems barrier. So for advertising, my five minute hack is to find a good expert and, and offload that. Unless that's a whole a rabbit hole you wanna go down down very deep. So which of, which of these areas is the first one a brand owner should offload? PPC, SEO, logistics, design, catalog troubleshooting. Which of those do you think is the easiest to offload? I think SEO, because um, a strong SEO foundation makes everything else work. And, you know, well, we may or may not touch on this, but that strong SEO foundation is ultimately what makes a brand very enticing for us as buyers. We don't want to buy a brand that has over time, you know, become drunk off of PPC uh, that, it, that has... It, it, Pretty hard to be drunk off PPC these days, especially with 35% year to date cost increases. Yeah. That tequila. I don't know, guys, that's, that's getting expensive. I might, I might change over to vodka. We'll see, but, but okay. So, but nonetheless, you're still, you're, you're making a merited point here. Um, so tell me a little bit about your strategy when it comes to um, SEO and indexing and all that. Steven, I think you've put out some very good content in this regard. Um, and, and it starts with kind of core keyword research. What are those high value, uh, call it alpha keywords that are, are really going to be highly relevant to your product, also relevant to your competitors and can in turn kind of train the A9 algorithm that your product is, is relevant for these. So I guess that's a long way of saying initially aim small. Um, don't try, try to boil the ocean. What are the most relevant keywords? Because ultimately, you get indexed and ranked for those keywords based on metrics like click-through rate, conversion rate. Uh, and if, if you're trying to cast an SEO net that is too wide and you're not getting clicks and conversions on those mid and long tail keywords, you're, you're setting yourself back and you're losing kind of that honeymoon blip that you get if you're just launching a product. So I, I really encourage sellers to start small do you, when, do you guess, when building an SEO footprint. Do you guys have like a matrix for number of keywords a product has to index for to increase their multiple to sell the brand or anything like that? We don't have a matrix per se, but it is one of those metrics that we monitor for our brands and that we look at in due diligence that we measure for the brands that we're looking at. Um, we have a few kind of in-house self-created metrics to measure SEO, but um, I think one that sellers can look to is what's your page one footprint? So of all that, let's say you rank for, you're indexed or ranked for a thousand keywords on a product. What percentage of those are on page one? Um, meaning you're in the first 48 search results if you're doing a, a gateway search, you're on the first 24 results if you're doing a, a refined search, or meaning you're in the first 14 results if you're doing a mobile search. So we really like to get a sense. Those, and those stats, products. by the way, are really interesting because I don't think people have talked about that. So I went through those really quickly. Should I go through yeah, them again? So Nate, I don't know if you need to go through them again per se, but so much is just explain that based on how you search on Amazon, you get different results. Maybe could you just explain that concept? 
Yeah. And, and this goes back to my Amazon days because, you know, I was trained to walk my store and it's not just walking the store on your desktop. It's, it's knowing that customers are searching on mobile. So, you know, pulling out your phone and, and walking your store on mobile. If you have an iOS, if you have an Apple uh, phone and you're on iOS, the app looks different than it does on an Android phone. So we were constantly, you know, walking around with multiple devices, walking our stores because the site experience is different. And we also knew that more and more customers were shopping on mobile. So we made a concerted effort to, to kind of pay attention there. And so what that means for you as a seller is you need to be doing the same. Uh, page one on mobile is a more limited set. So knowing that there's really only 14 results that show on page one on mobile, 14 organic results, for how many keywords are you, are you in those top 14? And if your product is one that, you know, through other data sources, you find customers are, are buying more from mobile than from desktop, it makes a lot of sense to invest your SEO efforts to building strength on those keywords for mobile, getting on page, page one for mobile versus on desktop. I bet Amazon has data to show that people are more likely to watch a video on mobile versus desktop. And that's why they rolled mobile ads out first um, before they went to desktop. Another example is social posts. So social posts don't currently show up on desktop on the detail page of a product, but they totally show up on mobile. It's one of the most undertapped free areas. It's like Instagram for Amazon. I'm always surprised people aren't investing and it's like, do you want some free traffic? Yeah, I'd love some free traffic. Okay, why aren't you making social posts? Um, stuff like that. All right, so those are some great tips, John. We, we went through a bunch of different like areas that people can explore and think about their products. So some really good uh, takeaways on expressing that. So let's pivot next to uh, form brands. So as an aggregator, um, I'm sure there's a few things that you're looking for when you try and, and purchase a brand. And for those that want to sell to an aggregator like form brands, what, what are those metrics that, that, that you're seeking? So <laughs> I, I, I have an answer, but I think it's largely become industry standard and, and uninteresting. Uh, like a lot of other aggregators out there, we're, we're looking for high quality financials. So you know, certain size, margin profile, What's the trend in, in the business? Um, we're looking for, we're, we're looking at aspects of the market to, to gauge potential. What's, what's the total addressable market? What's the competitive environment? And then we're also looking at just the operating opportunity. Uh, to the extent we put our thumb on the scale, well, what can we get from there? So, so what's, what's a, a unique it, thing um, that you guys do at Foreign Brands? Like, is your model different or is... Well, so let me just uh, expand on this. I think if you strip all that away, uh, financial, high quality financials, market potential, operating opportunity, what I really look for is someone who's gotten to know tens of thousands of brands on Amazon over the years is, does the brand have an identity? And I think that's important because- If you win on price identity, today, you're gonna lose on price tomorrow. But if you have an identity and you build a community, that's exactly. priceless. Identity is, is core to enabling us to build these brands into omni-channel winners, household brands. It's, it is something that's hard to do if you're just someone who kind of thoughtful, thoughtlessly spins up a brand on Amazon that doesn't have real emotional resonance. Um, customers often buy with their hearts and not their heads. And so what I'm looking for, and I'll, I'll cite Tough Cover again, is a brand that really has that that core identity that we can build off of. And, and oftentimes, you know, when we have kind of our investment committee uh, meetings, that can be the deciding factor on whether we write a check or we don't. Um, so I just wanted to share that because if you're, if, if anyone in the audience is kind of an emerging seller or, or thinking about private labeling, it, it's important to kind of begin with the end in mind and, and think about, you know, if, if you do plan on exiting, what's the identity that you want to infuse into the brand? A lot of times it's reflective of yourself as an owner or a personal problem that you dealt with. Um, but those I, I are, found that's kind in my opinion. Exactly. Solving your own problem. All right. So John, let's say I'm a brand. I want to sell the form brands. Where do I go next? Yeah. Uh, people can email me, John, J O N at formbrands.com or our website formbrands.com has a, a contact us link and, uh, our M&A team is very quick to reach out and loves to talk to sellers. 
I, I miss the days of uh, first name at my Amazon guy email addresses. Uh, we're 107 employees now, uh, and uh, there's like three Stevens, three Kristens, and it's just like ah. So uh, you'll, wait. You'll so know, what did you, what did you do? Did you do uh, first, first name dot last name? Last name. Yeah. Yeah. And and I didn't change any of the original ones. We just did you know new people coming in, um, and I think that's a good way to do it. But then like uh, people would make requests, and I was like, nope. Here's the new standard. Systematic <laughs> done. Uh, so it's not confusing at all. Well, John, it was great having you on the podcast today. A lot of good uh, thought provoking um, ideas that you presented. Um, I have a lot of respect for what Form Brands is doing. I think you guys are going to be successful. Uh, I think I think 30% of the ags out there are going to fail. And I think you guys are going to be one of the ags that are highly successful. Um, so John, thanks for coming on. I appreciate that, Stephen. It's been great talking to you. Great catching up as always. All right, that's the My Amazon Guy podcast today. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, and don't forget, every Friday at noon, Eastern Standard Time, come ask Stephen Pope. That's me, My Amazon Guy, AMA, every Friday at noon on youtube.com slash My Amazon Guy.